Today's scripture is from Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 35. I'll just give you a second to flip to that. And the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And that very hour he cured many of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard. Let that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. When the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak to the multitudes concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who are gorgeously apparelled and live in luxury are in king's courts. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. But I, but I say to you, for I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. And the Lord said, to what, to what then shall I liken the men of this generation, and what are they like? They are like the children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, saying, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned you, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, He has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a glutton and a winebiber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by all her children. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, we're continuing in the book of Luke. And uh, we started, was it October, September, October, and we're in chapter 7 now, so uh, it's going to be a while, uh, but here's the cool thing, it's God's Word. We could go to different books and everything, it's God's Word, there's always going to be something. Every Sunday you come, there's going to be something for you, I, just, I want you to come expecting, and it's not because... The preacher's so wise and so pithy, and, and you're going to get some really cool points from him. It's just we're going to get in the Word, and if you're expecting, then God's going to speak to you. So same thing when you're reading the Word on a daily basis. You get into the Word, just, just know that it's God's Word. It's going to be effective, and have your heart soft and ready to hear. So this morning, that's why I pray. Let's, let's pray as we get started. God, I thank you for your Word. I thank you that it's exactly what you want it to be. Um, everyone that you chose to write down your words, God, it's, it's exactly what you want. And it's what you want us to know about you and what you want us to know about the kingdom uh, that you, you're calling us into. God, I pray that we would understand uh, Jesus as our king in a greater way, that we'd understand his kingdom in a greater way. God, I pray that all of us would be part of your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, St. Patrick, um, yeah, pretty amazing story. There's a lot of folklore and everything about him, but um, some of the things we do know about him is that he was kidnapped um, by the Irish. Go Irish, right? Uh, kidnapped by the Irish, and was a slave for a while, and then he escaped, and then God told him in a dream to go back and share Christ with them. And so that's what he did. Pretty, pretty amazing that, that someone would do that. And uh, we're, we're told that there could be somewhere around 135,000 people that came to Christ through his ministry. Uh, 300 churches were um, started uh, by his influence. So pretty cool. It, it isn't just a holiday uh, to wear green and go do a bunch of drinking, right? It's like we've, we've really changed that holiday, haven't we, in the United States and uh, so March 17th is the day that he died. Uh, so it's a, it's a good thing to remember that God's called us to preach the gospel to anyone, right? Even, even our enemies. Uh, it's Luke chapter 7, 
starting in verse 18. And bear with me, I'm going to use my iPad because I could not get the printer. If we have any real good techie people, we need them. We need your gifts. God is... God has sent you here to this congregation uh, because he knew that I was working here. Uh, so, so I couldn't print this off. It's going to be an iPad. It might shut off from time to time, so that's what I'm doing in, in doing that. Anand's birthday today. Anand's good to have you here. Uh, anybody else have birthdays, anniversaries? I feel like we need to do that. What I love about Anand, one of the things I love about Anand, he's our youth pastor and he gives so much care and honor to our youth that when it's a birthday, he makes a big deal about it. Uh, we have a meal, or we have bring some dessert, and, and then, then we'll pray over that young person, and we'll even have people share, hey, what, what do you appreciate about that? So I, on and I love what you do with that ministry. Um, Okay, Luke chapter, <laughs> this is the third time I said Luke chapter 7. Here we go. So the Bible starts off with... Who? God. Yeah, it starts off with God, right? We're going to get there, too. But the Bible, the Old Testament, we get back to the Old Testament, the Bible starts with God. And that's really, really important because when we get into a text, if we don't go all the way back to God first, we forget what the original intent was for creation, for our lives, for our worship. And we'll just try to apply things. And so if we remember that in the beginning was God, and he created all things, right? So if he created all things, guess who's king over all those things? God is, right? So the, if you create something, you're in charge of it. That's yours. It belongs to you. So all of creation belongs to God. He's the king, and he has a kingdom. And he is a glorious kingdom. It's a glory. His, his rule and reign is beautiful. It's awesome. And it's over all the cosmos. And he created humans to be part of that kingdom. He created Adam and Eve to be in this beautiful paradise. I'm thinking like Hawaii, if you've been to, I just think that's probably what that was like. And that's going to be the new heavens and the new earth. But, but just think of this beautiful paradise and, uh, and they're created to be in relationship with God. Not just to, not just to enjoy the trees and the... I mean, we're, we're experiencing paradise in this weather, aren't we? Isn't this gorgeous? Everybody's moods all of a sudden, like everyone's all of a sudden happy and nice to each other. But just wait till Thursday, right? Wait, <laughs> wait till Thursday. See how nice everybody is. But yeah, it's just this beautiful creation. God created man and woman to be in relationship with each other and to be in relationship with him. But next part of the next act in the story is there's, uh, there's a creation of gods who fell, and that's Satan. Satan is a fallen angel who tricked Adam and Eve. He deceived Adam and Eve to not believe God, to not trust him, to think that he's lying about his about God's good rules. God is, he's a good king, isn't he? He's a good king, and he's to be trusted, but he'll give you the opportunity to not trust him, and that's what he did to Adam and Eve. He gave them the opportunity, the freedom to not choose him, and they didn't choose God, and so what they got was what God they got the opposite of what God offered. God offered life, eternal life, and they got death because of their sin. And you think, well, that's just not fair. But, but just think about it in our own lives. When we don't choose God, we don't get the things that he's about, right? It's, it's why would we get the things, how, how in the world could we get the things that he offers if we don't choose him? So Adam and Eve didn't choose God. They chose to go their own route, and they got kicked out of the garden. They got kicked out of this beautiful kingdom. But God wasn't finished. That could have been the end of the story right there. Just, it could have been ended with chapter 3 of Genesis, very short story, three chapters, and it could have been, and God would have been very just in just ending the whole, the whole story right there. But the story continues, and the story picks up even in Genesis chapter 3, where God promises that there's going to be someone to come to restore the fallen kingdom. That he's going to come to bring everybody back into the kingdom, all who would choose him as king. 
And so all the way through the Old Testament, if you think about this, the Old Testament can get very confusing, can't it? Uh, as we look through the, it's, it's a major part of your Bibles, but the Old Testament, also known as the Old Covenant, uh, God made a covenant with his people. Um, everything was leading up to the promise of this coming one who would restore the kingdom. We get to the New Testament or the New Covenant, this is the promise fulfilled. And the promise is fulfilled in who? Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment. And if you think about it, really all the promises throughout the Bible are ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. That's why sometimes I, you know, I, I don't want to get, I don't want to get into too much of a controversy here, but it's never really stopped me before. But here's, the, here's one of the problems I have uh, with some of our, our talk about, you know, especially when we're talking about Israel. Should we pray for Israel? Yes. Should we pray for Palestine? Yes. Who is God's people? Yes. <laughs> right? Now, I'm not saying what Hamas did to Israel was okay. We need to pray for Hamas. Number one, pray that they would repent so that they don't get what's coming to them by God's judgment. Pray that they would repent because guess what? Paul, the Apostle Paul, was a Hamas. He was a torturer. He, was, uh, he, he persecuted Christians, had them put in jail, had them put to death. So we could look at Paul and go, you know what? God loves a good story like that. He loves to turn terrorists into Christians. So number one, we could pray for Hamas. We could pray for uh, all the countries involved everywhere, right? Here's the, here's the thing is if we think that Israel or a chunk of land is the end of the promise, we don't understand the New Testament. We don't understand who Jesus is and why he came. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises, not Israel, not a chunk of land. Does that make sense? So it really confuses me when I hear a lot about, hey, God's, God's doing this through Israel. He's, this is the chunk of land. Here's the, here's the state. It's like, I understand all that. And there's promises in the Bible about the Jews coming back to Jesus, right? But really, true Israel is, is, are those who trust in Jesus. That's who true Israel is. And so don't, don't put your focus and attention on things that aren't Jesus. The new covenant is Jesus Christ. And this is going to come out real clear in this passage where Jesus is showing, I am the coming one. I am the one that was promised. I am. And it, you might be disappointed. You might have other ideas of who the king is supposed to be, like John did. But he is the king. He is the coming one. He's the one that's restoring all things back to his good creation. Now, because we all joined in with Adam and Eve's rebellion, because we all sinned, the Bible says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, we're part of another kingdom. The, the Bible talks about there being two kingdoms, and the two kingdoms are God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom, Satan's rule. The Bible talks about Satan being the, the kingdom of the powers of the air. He's the, he's the God of this world. He's the ruler of this world. And the Bible's clear that there's this ruler that's part of this world system that is in rebellion towards God, and we're all part of that. The Bible says that we're all part of that because of our choice not to follow God. And the thing is, there isn't one of us or anyone else that is perfect in following King Jesus. None of us are. So we've all been part of this kingdom called Satan's kingdom, which is also my kingdom, right? You can just think about my, you, we use my all the time. My, my, this, I, um, the things that we want for ourselves. That's really part of that same kingdom. It's not God's kingdom. It's your own kingdom, which is ultimately Satan's kingdom. But here's the thing about Satan's kingdom even. It isn't infinite. It isn't um, omnipotent it's under God's sovereign rule and we see this in the book of Job we see this other places too but in the book of Job we see Satan attacking Job 
but God letting him do it. And that's kind of unsettling, isn't it? It's like, oh, God, why did you do that? Why did you let Satan do that? Um, But Satan can't do anything just because he wants to. God's going to let him do things. And so we can find comfort in the fact that God is not only isn't unaware, he isn't uh, without power to do something, right? So he's always sovereign. He knows what's going on. Um, so the New Testament is where we find the book of Luke, where we're at. So it's in the, the New Covenant. It's where we find Jesus who has come. He's God who has become man. God went on a rescue mission for us. He didn't just send a messenger. He is the messenger. He is the one who came for us. Jesus is God who took on flesh. God's promises to restore all of creation under his kingdom is fulfilled in Jesus. He's the promised one. The Messiah, you've heard the word Messiah. That's really what's being talked about. The the chosen one, the promised one, the anointed one. So when you hear Messiah... When you hear Christ, Christ meaning Messiah, when you hear King, King Jesus, we're talking about the same ideas. He's the anointed one. He's the chosen one. He's the one where all the prophecies come in fulfillment. Now, if you're going through the Bible plan, we went through a book of the Bible that was just horrible, right? The book of Judges. And I'm so glad to be out of that book now. Now we're going to read Ruth, which is, that's a whole lot better. First Samuel, there's some, there's some awesome stuff in Samuel. But, but remember, everyone falls short. Every leader falls short because they're not Jesus. They're, they're a leader, but they're human. And same thing with our world. If you put your hope in any leader, in any human leader, they're going to let you down. They're not Jesus. They were never intended. Even, so even... Uh, your spouse, if you put all your hope in your spouse, you're going to be let down, right? Because they're human, and we're going to fail each other. But Jesus never fails us. He's the one that all the kings, all the prophets, all the, all the judges, all the sacrifices point to. He's the perfect sacrifice, the perfect king, the perfect judge, the perfect one. He's the one that everything points to. So remember that as we we get uh, into this text, and that's just the intro, sorry, okay. Luke chapter 3, turn back just a few pages to Luke chapter 3, this is important. So John the Baptist, right, that's that's how the New Testament starts off is with with John the Baptist, Um, and he's the... He's, he comes right before the Messiah. He comes right before Jesus, and that's his job. He was, he was, he was designed that way. But in Luke chapter 3, starting with verse 2, the second part of verse 2, God's word came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the vicinity of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight, the rough way is smooth and everyone will see the salvation of God. I wanna break out into the Messiah, right? We just start singing the Messiah here. He, he then said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by them. <laughs> John has a way with words here, doesn't he? Brood of vipers. How about if I addressed you that? He's like, how, how much would you guys keep coming back? Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. Don't start saying to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, John doesn't pull any punches, right? He cuts to the, he gets right to the point. It's like, if you don't accept, if you don't accept God's ways, there's judgment, right? There's fire. You need to repent or else. John was very clear, and the thing is, people went to him by the droves. They went to, just to, they flocked out into the desert, out into the wilderness to see him. Now, jump down to verse 15, 
It says, Now the people were waiting expectantly, and all of them were questioning in their hearts whether John might be the Messiah. They're going, is this the chosen one? Is this the promised one? John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one, is more, one who is more powerful than I is coming. I'm not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with fire that never goes out. Then along with many other exhortations, he proclaimed good news to the people. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the evil things he had done, Herod added this to everything else. He locked up John in prison. So that's where John is when we pick up this story. He's in prison because he, uh, he said true things about Herod and his family, and, and he got in trouble. That's what happens sometimes when you just say the truth about what, what uh, people are doing. Um, what's really important here is John was true in his, he was true in his preaching, that you either choose God or there's hell to pay. That's, that's very true, right? And so that's his message. He was sent by God to give that, but now we pick up in, in our story, and let's turn back to Luke chapter 7, and I want to read some of this, uh, starting with verse 18. Then John's disciples told him about these things. So what things? About the, the, the raising of the servant uh, from the dead, and or uh, healing the servant and raising the, the widow's son back to life. So these things, these, he, these healings, along with other things, John's in prison, John has disciples, and they're telling John, hey, here's what the Messiah is doing. Here's what Jesus is doing. And John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord, asking, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men reached him, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? That can be a little confusing, can't it? Because John already pointed to Jesus as the Messiah. In John's gospel, John calls, in the apostle John's gospel, John the Baptist calls Jesus, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's a pretty strong argument for someone being the Messiah, right? The chosen one. So how could John now be questioning, like, wait a minute, maybe we got this wrong. Is there, is there another one, or are you the one? Some people think that John is asking this on the behalf of his, of his disciples. Maybe. I don't think so. Sometimes we say that because we want to protect John. He's a prophet. And we don't want him to look too human uh, with his doubting, uh, with his questions. But here's the thing. Prophets are human, and they doubt it. They struggle. Pastors are human, and they struggle, and they have doubts. You are human, and you have doubts. And it's okay. Sometimes you've felt ostracized because you've had doubts and people might, you might feel like people are saying that you're not even a Christian now because you have doubts. That's, I'm, I'm sorry that that's happened. We don't want to be, we want to be a congregation where it's, you're free to bring your doubts. You're free to bring your questions. But, but what we're going to do is we're going to look to Scripture because we believe Scripture is God's Word, and we're going to look and see what does the Scripture say? What does God say? Because we believe there are answers there. Now, in, in some of the cults, some of you might have come from cults or you have families in cults. So one of the, the popular things that cults will do is not let you question things and say, that's not what we want to talk about right now. Let's just stay on track and just really push away your questions so you don't have to ask them. Well, here's why I think they do that a lot is because uh, not only because you might get off topic, but uh, we don't really have answers for those, <laughs> right? Now, if, if, if I were counseling you and you came to me with your doubts, would I have all the answers to your questions? No, I wouldn't. Uh, no one in this room 
probably would. Maybe some would do better than others. I know one of the things I do is, oh my goodness, that's a great question. I didn't even think of that. So now you, now you gave me a doubt, right? It's like, thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks for giving me a doubt. So, so we're going to look at Scripture, and we're going to pray. God, just help us to understand what this is, because we believe this isn't contradictory. People will say this is contradictory. It's not contradictory. It's, it's, it's a whole message from the same God. So, so what's going on with John? John, uh, da, 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 this is weird reading off the iPad. Okay, why did he do it? I think part of it is John's in jail, right? So if he's the Messiah, he's preaching freedom for the captives, and the Messiah is coming to bring vengeance and justice. Why is John in jail? That could be what's going on, partly. I would think, I would be thinking maybe some of the same things, like, what did I do wrong? When bad things happen to you, do you ask that sometimes of God? Like, God, what did I do? God, where are you? Do you care? I'm sure that was part of the thing with John. Don't, don't, don't make him deity, right? John the Baptist had real feelings as a real human. But also, here's what's going on. He preached a message that uh, if you don't choose God, there's vengeance, there's judgment. Is that true? That is true. How come Jesus isn't bringing it? I think that's a lot of what's going on here. Uh, are you the Messiah because you're preaching a lot of mercy and grace? and you're healing people, and you're bringing people back from the dead, and you're not getting rid of the Romans, and you're not, you're not, why aren't you getting rid of the Pharisees and letting them have theirs, the religious people? How come judgment isn't coming? Um, what John wasn't aware of is that the Messiah has two comings. And this first coming that we're looking at right here, when he came, as we celebrate, when he came at Christmas, like Kent was talking about, and he came ultimately to die on a cross and to rise again from the dead, his first coming into the world was to announce the kingdom of God and ultimately to pay for our sins. That's what he came to do. He didn't come to judge. He came to take our judgment. He didn't come for vengeance. He came to take the wrath of God on himself. His second coming, which hasn't happened yet, his second coming will bring perfect justice. He will punish all those who reject him. If you're looking forward to everything being made right again, how many of you are looking forward to everything being made right again? Yeah, me too. That's what's going to happen in the second coming. It hasn't happened yet. There are good things happening. People's hearts are changing. People are coming to know him. There's goodness in, in the midst of this wicked world but it isn't made right yet. So John's wondering, where's the justice? Where's the judgment? Jesus is just, and he does handle sin, but not in the way we would. I think if you, maybe you're like me, that I would just want to wipe out evil, just like, hey, let's not have patience with this. Let's, uh, my kids know that. It's like I get frustrated, and so I just yell. It's like, well, that really helped out a lot. Thanks a lot, Dad. Uh, Jesus is just. He's the king who came to die the jews didn't understand that's not a victorious king a victorious king is going to take care of the romans a victorious king is going to bring a sword a victorious king is going to take the nation by force jesus is not the king that we think we need he is the king we actually need and i missed the first point the first point i, I blew by that jesus came with grace and mercy um, the first time, and when he comes a second time, he's going to bring judgment. Okay, that's, that's the first point. When he came the first time, he came with grace and mercy, but when he comes a second time, he brings judgment. He is the king that we actually need. Our greatest problem is that we are sinful. We are separated from God, and here's the thing. We're separated from God, and you can't do anything about it. You're lost, you're going to hell because that's the only other option if you're not going to follow God, which we've all said we're not going to. That's what sin is. There's only one other choice, and you can't get out of hell. You can't. You can't. There's nothing that you can do about it. 
that is the key to understanding the gospel. The key to understanding the gospel is to, to recognize that we're in need. Verse 22, look at verse 22, says, he replied to them, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Those with leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And then he ends with this, and I think he's getting climactic here. I think he's getting to a point here of climax. He's saying, the poor are told the good news. The poor are told the good news. So number two, if you're writing down these points in the outline, Jesus can only save you if you know you're poor. Jesus can only save you if you know you're poor. Now, think about this. The poor are not necessarily economically poor, right? Now, it does include the economically poor. But the, the poor are those who have needs that only God can meet. Only God can meet. They're poor. When we find ourselves in that place, we can understand the good news of the gospel. Does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense, then you don't know you're poor. Because a lot of times in churches, it's, man, Jesus is sure nice. I, l I just need to add him to my life. I need, I need a little Jesus in my life. Sunday is nice for a little bit of Jesus. That's not the gospel. The gospel is you're poor and in need and in hell and have the wrath of God and you can't do anything about it. When you realize that, when you hear that Jesus came to give you eternal life for free and there's nothing you can do about that, there's no good works, there's nothing you can do, you can't perform to get his grace, you can't be born into a family to get his grace, you can't be a pastor to get his grace, there's no, you can't sit in the front row to get his grace, you can't give a lot of offering to get his grace. There's nothing you can do to get his grace. It's something that he gives you freely. When you understand that, you understand the gospel. If you just think that Jesus is just a great religion, a great way of life, you don't get the gospel. And so you don't get salvation. If you don't know you're poor, you can't be saved. I hope that makes sense. I hope I'm coming across on that. Does that make sense? Um, do you know... You are utterly dependent on God to save you. Verse 23 says this. Blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. <laughs> and he wants John to know this. John, you're blessed if you're not offended by me. I know I'm not the guy you thought I was going to be. I know I'm not the Messiah you thought. You were looking forward to someone uh, taking it to the Romans, right? You were looking forward to someone uh, just totally annihilating uh, the Roman nation. But, but here, I've, can't, I've come for something much greater than that. Blessed are those who aren't offended by me. That would be a message for all of us, too. Jesus isn't quite the Messiah we think he should be or the king we think he should be. God, I don't know why I'm going through this pain. God, I don't know why I'm going through this. God, I don't know why you don't fix this. He's the king he came to be, not the king you think he should be. And blessed are you if you're not offended by that. Blessed are you if you don't fall away. That's another translation of that, that phrase there is, blessed are you if you don't fall away because of who he is. Then, just so people wouldn't misunderstand John, right? It's like, so he's talking about John and his front of a big crowd, and so now people could be going like, man, John really didn't get it, did he? <laughs> As, uh, his ministry, is, uh, may, you know, they may be ta starting talking bad about his ministry. It's like, yeah, I don't know why John didn't get it. Not that they got who the Messiah was either. But John, or Jesus, lifts up John in his ministry. He, he says, um, who did you go out to see? Who did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? When then did you go, or uh, what then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? See, those who are splendidly dressed and live in luxury are in royal palaces. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. More than a prophet. So John was amazing in his ministry, but he was, can I say this, weird? He was weird. 
He ate bogs and honey, and he wore camel hair. All right, so he's not out, he's not dressed to impress. He's not going out and like, all right, folks, follow me. I've got, he's not the flowery speech. He's not going to win you, uh, win friends and influence people. He's not, he's not that guy. He's the guy that's going to, you're a brood of vipers. You, why do you say you're following God when it doesn't even show in your actions? Have fruit of, that shows your repentance because you're hypocrites. And he was he was so good at just telling it like it is, right? Um, so, so Jesus is saying, why did you go out to see him? What, what did you expect to see? Was it just going out in the wilderness and seeing a bunch of plants? Now, that could be a figurative thing, using the, the reeds, that he's not a soft guy that just blows in the wind and, and just is influenced by people. He's a strong man who, who preached a strong message And he's a prophet, and he's even more than a prophet. He goes on to say, see, I am sending. This was written about him. This was written about him in Malachi chapter 3. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John. So get what Jesus is saying. Moses, great guy, great prophet, John's greater. David, what an amazing king. Wrote all these psalms. Everyone talks about that kingdom that David was king over. We want that kind of kingdom again. John's greater. Everyone in the history of the Bible up until John uh, is superseded by John. John's the greatest. Why? It's because of his role. It's because of what he got to do. He got to introduce He's the MC. Let me introduce to you Jesus. Now imagine this for centuries. They were looking for the chosen one. They were waiting for the chosen one. He was promised all the way back in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned. And John gets this privilege to announce the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Savior of the world, is here to save us. That's why he's so great. But then he goes on and he says something utterly shocking if we understand what he says here. He says, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What? So so John's the greatest. Now, now John's not greater than Jesus, right? He was born of a woman, but kind of differently than everybody else, right? Virgin birth, and Jesus has no sin. He's God, so ultimately he is better. But folks, You're greater, Jesus is saying you're greater than John. John's greater than everybody else, but he's saying you're even greater. Why? Not because of anything you did, not because of of anything intrinsically about you, it's because of your position. It's because of timeline where you are now. You are here in the time of history. Everyone else was looking up to Jesus. Now we're looking back to Jesus. Jesus has died. He's paid for our sins. He took our sin. He gave us his righteousness. We're his kids. We're in the kingdom. And we have the Holy Spirit. That's a privileged, privileged position that anyone in the Old Testament did not have any clue what that would be like. And so we need to remember the greatness of having that privilege as his kids, the king's kids. You're the king's kid. Don't hang your head. Don't don't mope around going, oh, I'm such a loser. You're not a loser unless you don't choose Jesus, then you are. But uh, no, you're not a loser. You're not a loser if you're in the kingdom of God because he's given you Everything. Everything. You're the king's kid. The inheritance is yours. And part of that inheritance is the Holy Spirit in your life. That changes everything, folks. That changes everything. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon people from time to time. Now we have the Holy Spirit with us. And we need to pray that we be filled with the Holy Spirit all the time, right? We need to pray for that filling, but you're greater because you live in the kingdom if you confessed him as your Lord and Savior. That's where we're going with this message, too, is like, if he's your Lord and Savior. Number three, in your outline, if you're writing this down, 
Those who have Jesus as king are greater than John the Baptist. Those who have Jesus as king are greater than John the Baptist. Now, look at verse 29 and 30. A little parenthetical point here that Luke makes. He says, when all the people, including the tax collectors, I like that, (laughs) including even the tax collectors, folks, uh, heard this, they acknowledged God's way of righteousness because they had been baptized with John's baptism. But since the Pharisees and experts in the law had not been baptized by him, they rejected the plan of God for themselves. See, there's two opposite responses that Luke records. The common people, including the outcasts, agreed with Jesus and acknowledged that God's way was right. Right? Everything that Jesus is saying, what John's saying, is like, I agree, that's the right way. I'm praying that that's you. When we get into the word of God, I'm praying that you're going like this. When we're reading the word and you're going, yes, I agree. I don't, I don't always like it. I don't always understand it. I agree. Why? It's God. It's God saying it. So that's one type of person. Um, on the other hand, the leaders, the spiritual leaders who memorize the law, They really knew the law. They rejected what Jesus said. Maybe it applies to other people. It applies to them, because we're certainly uh, following the law. In fact, people need to follow our example, right? Is that arrogance? Isn't that attractive, arrogance? Isn't self-righteousness just something you want to follow after? Don't you just want to hang out with self-righteous people? Not That's how the world sees a lot of Christians. Arrogant, self-righteous, I got it together, why don't you? Um, My life is is great. But but the world needs to hear from us, like, man, I've blown it. When I counsel with people a lot of times so that the message is heard, so the counseling is heard, I'll I'll identify myself in a situation too just so that we're in the same human condition, so that it's not like, I'm a freak, I've blown it, and you're, of course, you're, you've got it all together, and everyone else at church, you know, one of the reasons we don't come clean with things, one of the reasons we don't confess sin, is because we think everyone else has it together. If we really knew each other, we'd be confessing things, but we're going, yeah, I can confess to them, because I know that they would understand, because they're, they're messed up too. We're a messed up folk that God loves. He adores. And we can confess because it's the way for healing. James 5, 16 says it's, that's how we find healing is we confess our sins to one another. We find forgiveness when we confess to God. We're just, confession is just saying what's true. It's like, Here's my sin. I love that about Celebrate Recovery. It's just about being real with each other. Okay, let's drop the masks. Let's just come together, be real, and understand there's no one here perfect except Jesus. And so let's keep pointing each other to Jesus. The reason for people receiving Jesus' word or rejecting it was whether or not they were baptized by John's baptism. That's what Jesus said. John's baptism required confession and repentance of sins. If someone was willing to be baptized, made all the difference. Luke earlier records that John went throughout the Jordan area preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, preparing the way for the Lord. Many were convinced of their sin and need of a Savior. They knew they were sinners deserving of God's wrath. So they confessed their sins and were baptized. But the Pharisees and the experts of the law, they prided themselves in keeping the law and based their righteousness on their own rule-keeping. They didn't humble themselves to be baptized. Baptism is a humble act, isn't it? You're going to get all wet. Your hair's going to get messed up. People are going to look at you. You're going to be in front of people. You're going to be out. We're all going to be dry. You're going to be all wet. And someone else is dunking you. It's like, oh, I hope I'm not down there too long. I hope they bring me back up again. It's a humble act to be baptized. Jesus, you are king, and I'm not. That's a humble act act, isn't it? A humble confession. I'm a sinner who has rejected you. That's humility. I need you to save me from the penalty of my sin and the power of sin. 
Repentance isn't just for other people. I need to repent. Baptism isn't just for other people. I need to be baptized. In Christian baptism, there's some similarities to John's baptism. We're repenting of sin and confessing Jesus as Lord. Recognizing Jesus is forgiving our sins. And we're identifying with Jesus in his death and resurrection. Galatians 3.27 even says that those who are baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. If you haven't confessed Jesus as your Lord and confessed your need for him to save you from your sins, do it now. Right now where you're at. Don't wait for me to pray. Just where you're at, just tell God, yes, I I say yes to you. I want to follow you. I want you to be king of my life. I'm tired of being king of my life. If you haven't been baptized by immersion as an adult, as the scripture says, Jesus commands you to do that. He commands you to be baptized. You can do that today. Now, I did forget to put water in here. Shame, bad pastor. So we can fill that up afterwards. It's a nice day. Let's go to Angle Lake. We've, Macy's been down to the Puget Sound to get baptized. We could even do that. We can go down to the Puget Sound today. W- when's the best time to follow Jesus? Oh, let's see, Tuesday. Let's put it, let's look at Google calendars. Let's look for a good day that I can commit my life. Now, right? Now. And here's one of the big reasons for now is the devil is real. He loves to trip people up. He loves, if, you, if the Holy Spirit, it's never me. If you're convinced you need to follow Jesus, it's not the pastor. It's not slides up on the wall. It's not the music. It's the Holy Spirit and you saying, come, come, come. Follow the only king that there is. Come and follow him, right? It's the Holy Spirit. So when we, when we say wait to the Holy Spirit, what happens is it's real easy to say wait and keep saying wait. But when the quicker we say yes to Jesus, the easier it is every time that he calls us to do something to do it. So I'd encourage you just any time. But here's, here's one of the things I was convicted of this last week. It's like, ah, uh, I've thought about, we need to have a baptism class, right? Just so we can answer questions. Just a simple baptism. Well, let's get into the scripture. What does the Bible say about? Let's, you know, let's get together. Then I'm going, hey, there's a thing called Zoom. And we've, we're all introduced to that now, aren't we? Because of 2020. <laughs> you go, no, not. Uh, but so the next slide is, we're going to have a baptism class on Thursday. And so if you want to join me, I'll be up on Zoom. We can have a little chat on, you can still, you can be in your jammies if you want to. You can, you, whatever, your work clothes, you don't have to shower or anything. You can be eating your dinner if you want to. But here's the big deal. If you're not baptized, Jesus commands you to be baptized. So some people would say, are you saying I'm not saved if I'm not baptized? I'm not saying that, but I'm not saying you are saved if you're not baptized. I'm saying you come to Jesus, he's the one who saves you, and then he tells you, let me tell you how you say yes to me. You confess your sins, you repent, and you're baptized. And then you follow me the rest of your life. Because it's not just say yes to Jesus, then live any way you want to. That's what a lot of people have done. Said the prayer, I'm in heaven, now I can do whatever I want. That doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. So if you haven't been baptized, here's one way you can do it. It's, um, I'll send an email, but it's also on our website now. And I know we've been horrible at keeping that up, but there is one event now (laughs) that I created called the baptism class. You can click on that. Uh, You can look at this Zoom, and we'll send an email out, too, for that. Or just put on your Connect card that you want to be part of that class. If you can't make it to that or you don't Zoom, let me know. And if you go, I want to find out more about baptism, we'll just get together, right? Let's just get together, either in person, phone call, whatever. It's that important. Maybe you'd like to be baptized on Easter. Now, I just said, when's the best time to say yes to Jesus now, right? Um, But let's just say... Man, Easter, I know my family's going to be there. I want to make it a big deal. It's the resurrection of Jesus. Let's have a bunch of people getting baptized. Not for numbers. I don't want that. I want just let's be obedient to Jesus. Let's follow him in everything. It's a picture when we're baptized. It's showing our identification and allegiance to Jesus. It's a picture of the washing away of our sins and being born again. 
Okay, I have minus two minutes, so here's the last point. Number four, will you accept or reject Jesus as your king? He finishes, to what then should I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to each other. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament, but you didn't weep. But John the Baptist, for John the Baptist did not come eating bread or drinking wine. And you said, he has a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. What he's saying is, there's always been people saying, Jesus, we want you to be this kind of king. Jesus, here's we, how we expect you to lead us. Jesus, how come you don't do it the way we want you to do it? And Jesus saying, I didn't come for that. I didn't come to be the king that you want. I came to be the king that you need. Because we don't even know what our greatest needs are. He is so good that he doesn't give us what we pray for all the time, right? It's like, it, thank you, Lord, for not giving me everything I've prayed for, because that's, that isn't what I've needed every time but you give me exactly what I need. You give me more than I need. There are only two positions you can take with Jesus. Receive him as your king or reject him and be your own king. To be neutral about Jesus is to reject him as your king. When it, in verse 35 says, wisdom is vindicated by all her children, saying is proved right. God's wisdom is shown to be right by those who follow him. Your testimony to Jesus and how he changed your life proves God's wisdom. By you following Jesus, it proves, like, it really is the right way. It really is the right way to follow him. Your testimony isn't about your ability to change your life, but God's amazing grace and power to change your life. So here's what we're going to do, is we're all going to respond one way. I'm going to give you a chance to respond. Some of you, it's going to respond for the first time to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you want to meet with someone right now to talk about that, I'll be out in this little alcove area, and I'll, I would love to meet with you. For those of you who are believers, here's what we're going to do to respond. The, the reason we put the, the communion up here, it's, it's a way for us to respond, to move forward to Jesus. And let's look for people that need some, some help with that, so make sure everybody gets, everybody that wants that. So if you're a believer, um, he calls you to, to remember his death on the cross. Remember, with the, the blood and the, th his body that was broken uh, for us, for the forgiveness of our sins, let's, let's thank him for being our king. So let's, let's take that time. Let me pray for us as we do that. God, I just pray that as we come forward to take communion, that it would be more than just a, a religious act, that, God, we'd be taking you in. We'd be taking your very presence in our lives, God, that you're the king. You, we want you to be on the throne of our lives. God, thank you for the forgiveness of sins that you've given us. Thank you that we can freely confess and not be judged, that you've come to, uh, to save us, not to condemn us. God, I pray for those who haven't made that decision yet, that today they would make that decision to follow you as their Lord and Savior, that we'd have a conversation and, and get that relationship um, started with you. I pray for those who need to be baptized, God, for, for them to go through with that beautiful, beautiful act of joining in with you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.